<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so hello everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, so on the occasion of the American Day uh, of Independence, we have here uh, from Kent State, Ohio, Jonathan Selinger, who has been here for six weeks, uh, and staying until tomorrow. Uh, so if you still want to talk with him or with Robin Selinger, who's also here, from Kent State for six weeks. Uh, uh, try to get on with him here tomorrow. Um, Jonathan has agreed to give uh, us uh, his introduction to topological defects, and uh, I'm sure they'll be interesting. Uh, we arranged this kind of in the last minute in an informal setting. I didn't know if we would have a few people in the room or 200. Um, so we didn't order any pizza. As we usually do. Oh, wait. No, no, wait. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> wait. But um, we, are tr we are trying to arrange pizza. <laughs> <laughs> While we're enjoying Jonathan's talk, uh, Sharon will make uh, things happen and we'll have pizza uh, probably just outside. Or we'll figure that out at the end of the talk. So uh, stay with us. There may be pizza at the end, uh, and if not, then we'll try to uh, stay back uh, in other formats, in other places. So please, Jonathan. Well, um, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Yair. And thank you for putting up an American flag in my honor. That was so great. Uh, right. Happy 4th of July. That's it. OK, so for, for, um, for a long time, I've had the goal of trying to write a book about topological defects, where I would take the stuff that I have learned from smart people like Ivan Smolyuk and try to explain it in a possibly simpler way. And so um, today is my uh, very first attempt at something like that. So um, thank you for being my, my ALF testers uh, here. Um, I, uh, so the, the outline of the, the whole proposed scheme is, is like this, okay? And I'm not gonna do it all today, okay? What, what, I, uh, what I would think, think of is to start with kind of a, a basic example that illustrates the principles of topological defects, um, and then to start putting on generalizations to that, and then talk about other issues like energy, dynamics, statistical mechanics, and so forth. Okay. What I actually prepared for today is the first two things. Okay, so the basic example, the uh, kind of tutorial uh, example, um, and then a set of generalizations to more complex situations. And um, so that's where um, I got tired and I stopped making TV graphs at that stage. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna go through those things. And then if any of you are still interested and wanna ask about any of the other stuff, then I can just talk about it on the board. And maybe I'll do the, the, the last one about topology as an approximation for physics, just on the board. Um, okay. But to begin with the, the first uh, kind of tutorial example here, okay? Let's think about the idea of uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking, okay? So there's a system that has a high temperature phase that's disordered, and then you reduce the temperature and it goes into a low temperature phase that's ordered, okay? Suppose the kind of order parameter for this system is a vector in two dimensions. Okay, we call that the xy model because the, the order can be something in the xy plane, no component in the z direction. Okay, we could think of that as a magnetic moment, for example, that could point anywhere in the xy plane, but it can't point in the z direction. Okay, then the order parameter is a two dimensional vector which has a magnitude and a direction. The magnitude 
is something which is determined by temperature, right? So when you learn, for example, mean field theory for the ferromagnet, right, you learn how the magnitude depends on temperature. And that's strongly locked in at a particular magnitude at a particular temperature. It's not going to vary as a function of position. At least it will vary very much as a function of position. Is there a question on the Zoom here? We could say that um, the magnitude is uniform everywhere. Right? And then there's an orientation, which is characterized by some unit vector. So some n as a function of position, right, which is a unit vector in the xy plane. So we could write it as cos theta and sine theta. Where theta depends on position. Okay. The thermodynamics doesn't lock in what's the direction, right? The mean field theory, say, for magnetism fixes a magnitude but not a direction. So that can easily vary as a function of position. So we want to look at a, a range of configurations that have different dependencies of the orientation as a function of position with all the same magnitude, okay? So suppose we have a one-dimensional system, okay? We have this two-dimensional vector that's a function of one coordinate, x, right? And there's some kind of locking on the boundaries. Suppose on the boundaries, the director, I'll call it a director by the crystal analogy, okay? The unit vector has to be in the, the y direction on the two boundaries, at x min and x max. Okay? And in the interior, it varies continuously. Okay, So as you go along, it's smoothly changing like that. Okay? Now, I'm going to draw it on a limited set of points, right? So this picture, I, this picture means the same thing as this picture. Okay, This one may look like a lattice, but it's not a lattice. It's a continuously varying field that's varying smoothly as you go from position to position. All right, so now let's classify some of the configurations that might form, okay? Which are consistent with the requirement that the director is vertical on the two edges and with the requirement that um, it has the same magnitude everywhere, right? There's a whole bunch of configurations, all right? Uh, here's another whole bunch of configurations. Here's another whole bunch of configurations, okay? You can see that within each bunch, um, it's continuously transforming from one to another, right? I'm making a sequence of tiny little changes in the director field to go from one configuration within the bunch to another. All right. But I cannot continuously transform from something in set number one to something in set number two or set number two to set number three. All right. There is no way to get from one set to another set without either changing the magnitude of the arrows so that the arrow somewhere passes through zero magnitude or violating the boundary position. Okay? And I'm making the assumption that those things, either of these things, would cost a huge amount of free energy so that can't possibly happen. Okay, So that means there has to be a huge energy barrier for going from one of the sets to another set. So how, how do I know that they're different? Okay, that would be by, um, whoops, all right, go forward. here it is. We could characterize the configurations by counting the number of times that the director uh, rotates through a full circle as we go from X min to X max, right? So in set one, that number of times is zero, right? If the director's never change it, right? Or in any of the variations, uh, like, like that, okay? It changes in a positive sense and then it changes back in a negative 
sets. Okay, so it integrates to zero. Okay, in set number two, the director is changing in a positive sense through a full 360 degrees to pi radians as you go from the left to the right. In set number three, it's changing in a negative sense through two pi radians as you go from the left to the right. Okay. Now, whenever, uh, so, so this defines uh, a, a winding number, how many times it winds through a circle. You take the integral of the change in angle and divide by two pi. All right. um, and if you want to work in terms of the end vector instead of working in terms of theta, no problem. You can transform this integral into something with the end vector. Um, this quantity has to be an integer because of the boundaries, right? That the boundaries are vertical. And so when you go from one boundary around to another boundary, you have to go through some integer number of two pi rotations, okay? It has to be an integer, okay? But when you make tiny little transformations in the whole configuration, you can only make a tiny little transformation in the X, okay? But there is no tiny little transformation from one integer to another integer. Those are all big jumps, okay? So that's a kind of proof that, um, that uh, you can only make tiny little transformations that keep the same S and don't change to a different S, all right? And so there's a different S for each of these sets. It's plus one up there. No, it's zero up there. Ha -ha. It's plus one in the second, and then it's minus one in the, the third. All right. Now, let's scale up to two dimensions. All right. So suppose we have a two-dimensional configuration like this. And again, there's some boundary condition that the director has to be vertical uh, on the uh, left edge and the right edge. Okay. So now we could calculate the winding number as we go on any kind of path from the left to the right, okay? Just integrating the same thing, okay? So let's see, here are some paths. Um, here are some paths, all these green lines, okay? So if I integrate along any of these green lines and calculate the winding number, it's zero, 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 okay? But on the paths up here, if I calculate the winding number on any of those paths, it's minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, okay? So this winding number uh, as a function of where you put the path is changing discontinuously from zero everywhere here to minus one everywhere there. And um, furthermore, the paths don't have to be straight lines. Right? I could make a funny kind of path that, you know, goes to the curvy way that works, right? Or I could make a path that goes around the red dot and comes around there, okay? And the point is that for any path that goes below the red dot, you get zero. For any path that goes above the red dot, you get S equals minus one. Question. So... What about that that goes through the dot? Doesn't that make a magnitude zero uh, arrow? A path that goes through the dot um, is, is, is singular, right? That's a weird path if it, goes, if it goes through the dot because the dot is a point where the unit vector is undefined, right? That the magnitude uh, of, the, of the magnetic order or whatever kind of order it is uh, is, is zero, so you can't define a unit vector, okay? So the red dot is a special weird point that violates the assumptions here, okay? And because it's a weird point, uh, the integral is not even defined because there's, the integral includes a place where there's no theta, right? So I can only say what the integral is for paths that are going above or below the red dot and not for paths that are going through the red dot. Okay, excellent. All right, so that's to say there's something special about the red dot. Whoops, there's something special about the red dot, okay? 
So now to sort of focus in close to the red dot, but not right at the red dot, let's make a couple of two paths like this, okay? We'll have a path here that goes straight and then tiny little loops just below the dot. It keeps going over this, okay? That has winding number of zero because it's below the dot, okay? I could make a path that goes here and then a tiny little curve around above the dot there. And that has a winding number of minus one. one. But let's combine them, okay? So I'll do the bottom path first, and then I'll come back by the top path, okay? So bottom path, that gives zero. The top path backwards gives plus one, because, you know, you do an integral backwards, it gets a negative of that integral forward, okay? So the total for this combined path is going to be plus one. Now, if we want to break this down some more, we could say the integral on this straight segment, whatever it is, it cancels the integral on that straight segment because they're very close to each other and they can take a limit where they go right on top of each other. Okay, so likewise, the integral on this straight segment cancels that straight segment. Okay. So really what I have is an integral around a loop going around the red dot in a counterclockwise sense, okay? And um, any such loop is going to give an, a winding number of plus one, okay? So that works for a tiny little loop like this, or it could work for a great big loop like that, okay? Any loop going around the red dot it will give a winding number of plus one. So at this point, we make a kind of intellectual jump, all right? That is to say, um, instead of saying that the winding number characterizes the path from the left side to the right side, we can say the winding number characterizes the red dot, okay? It's saying the winding number is telling us something about the red dot, right? That the red dot, oops, the red dot, you know, is, is a place where winding numbers change from zero to minus one, right? And that's described, hmm, it's not working. If that's described by, um, by uh, what happens going around the loop, okay? So the red dot, that's a topological piece, okay? We can say the red dot is a point which is singular, that is, it's a place where the unit vector is undefined, uh, but it has properties that you can learn about by looking at places where the director is well defined by integrating in this loop going around the dot. So topological defects, other words, people say explanation, aster, vortex. Um, and it's, it's defined by this winding number of any group around the defect. And this quantity, you could call this topological charge, right? Kind of like an electric charge, right? There's nothing electrical about it, but this loop construction maybe reminds you of Gauss's law for electrostatics, right? That it, uh, uh, something going around a point tells you about what's inside the material. Okay, so that's the basic idea of a topological defect. And now we can forget about the boundary conditions, right? I needed the boundary conditions to get started with, but now I'm down to just a loop around the dot and this loop is nowhere close to the boundaries. So forget about the boundaries, okay? And I can consider topological defects in the, in the bulk defined by this loop Okay, and here are several examples which all have a topological charge of plus one, okay? Because with any of these examples, if you go around the loop in a counterclockwise sense, okay, the director rotates through uh, an angle of two pi in a counterclockwise sense, right? So here, you know, it starts like this, so you go around like that right here, 
which it starts like this. And again, it goes around counterclockwise. Okay. So this is sometimes confusing for beginners because they think, well, this should be the opposite of that. Okay. But it, it's not. The, the analogy with Gauss's law doesn't work that way. And so these come out to be the same as far as the winding number goes. And so is this. And so is this. Okay. These all have a winding number of plus one. They're different in other ways, but not for the winding number. Um, what if you want a negative one? Well, that would look like, like this. Okay. So here, uh, if you start uh, with the vector pointing uh, this way, Let's see, and then you go around here, you're going around, and the director rotates through a full two pi uh, in a clockwise sense as you go on a counterclockwise path. Okay, so this is a, a minus one. In this tutorial example, there is a nice further analogy with electric charges in the sense that you can have two defects nearby each other and then draw a great big loop to see what's the total uh, topological charge that's enclosed, okay? So here's a plus one, here's a minus one, here's a great big loop, and if we look at the integral going around the big loop, you get zero, okay? So these charges add up like regular integers with positive and negative signs. Right. Here's an example that has two plus ones. And if you draw a great big loop around both of them, you get a total topological charge of plus two, okay? So they're adding up like, like electric charges, like, like integers. Okay. The warning is that this is not true in general for all topological Okay, this can fail for other examples. It works in this example, but not in others. Okay, back to one dimension. Okay, because I'm not done with this tutorial thing yet. Okay. Let's go back to one dimension. Okay, so here is an example with uh, a winding number going from the left to right of uh, plus one. Okay, and in this picture, the distortion is really spread out, right? As you go from all the way on the left to all the way on the right, you have this gradual distortion. It doesn't have to be spread out, okay? Maybe it could get concentrated somewhere. That's this movie, okay? So we could try to concentrate the distortion somewhere. Whoops. We could try to concentrate the distortion somewhere. To make it stop at the end. Thanks. And then it looks like this. And then it looks like this. Okay. Once this distortion is concentrated somewhere, then it looks like you have a pretty uniform system over there and a pretty uniform system over here. And kind of a point-like object in between, okay? Some weird sort of point in between. Uh, why would the material do that? Well, for some energetic reason, which I'm not really going to talk about, okay? But maybe there's some applied field in the vertical direction, and so energy favors aligning the orientation with the applied field in most of the region and only having a little place where it's misaligned with the field, okay? So if you're looking at this from somewhere far away, you'd say, well, there's uniform and then some kind of point-like object and then uniform, all right? The point-like object, it's not a mathematical point. It doesn't have zero size but it has like kind of a small size, okay? And this point-like object with a small size uh, is still characterized by a winding number, right? There's still this distortion where the orientation rotates through two pi from the left to the right, okay? So what is this thing, okay? 
Um, people might call it a wall or a two pie wall, right? Because it's a place where the director rotates through two pie as you go from the left side of the object to the right side. Okay. Uh, uh, more mathematically inclined people might call it a topological soliton or topological structure or topological texture. Um, so people like Yvonne Smolyuk would use words like that. Now, if you go out in the wild, okay, there are lots of scientists who call this sort of thing a topological defect or a non-singular topological defect or something like that, okay? I'm not saying people should call it a topological defect. I'm just saying people do call it a topological defect, okay? So, if you are a naive, impressionable young person, like me at age 50, um, <laughs> you, you might think that this is a topological defect with a winding number. The last thing I showed you was a topological defect with a winding number. They're probably the same thing, right? Wrong. They are not the same thing. They are completely different things. Okay, let's look at a comparison between them. Okay. So for the first thing that I showed you, which I call the topological defect, okay, this is a point-like object in two dimensions in this example I showed you. For the, the second thing, which here I'll call it a topological soliton, okay, it is a point-like object in one dimension, okay? Point in one dimension is different from a point in two dimensions. Okay. This topological defect has a singular point, this red dot where the director is undefined. Right? Um, this topological soliton does not have a singular, right? The director is well defined everywhere. Even if you zoom in close here, it's well defined all along there. Right? In this case, the topological charge is an integral around the defect. You stay out of the red dot and draw around the dot. Right? Here, you go straight on through the topological salt. Um, and maybe one more thing to say is in this case, the, the defect has a long range effect on the director field. That is, even if you don't see this point uh, and you just probe the director field really far away, you can tell that there's a defect there after I get ready to be good. Okay. But here, if you um, if you don't look at this thing and you just look at the director far away, yeah, it all looks pretty uniform, right? And so um, in this situation, right, if you were to blast the material with a laser right here, okay? So you heat up this region and then let it cool down and anneal, you could get rid of this thing, right? And it would just be uniform. But here, if you heat up right around this point and then let it cool down, it's still got a problem, right? It can't just anneal. Uh -huh. It's not usually in the two-dimensional case, you could also get a soliton. So if you play the same game, you say there is an external field, Yes. All the directors want to point in some direction as much as they can. Would you also get a soliton? Yes, I was going to talk about that later. But right, you could take this whole thing and just extend it in the second dimension. So you will get a line? And you will get a line. So you can't get a point in soliton. Correct. Or at least not, not this type. You might get other types of point solitons. But this type would give you a line in 2D. That is it's related to a screen. I'll get to that in a few minutes. It's, it, but it's, it's in the same family as the spermia. Yes. As a baby spermia. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So um, this, is, this is my simple example. Okay. So this is how I teach topological defects while standing on one foot or something. Right. Okay. So um, now, we can generalize this in several ways, okay? 
let me get a picture of me teaching some of the time. So sending on one foot. All right. Um, okay. Um, this, that's, there are three ways to generalize this, okay? You can think about changing the dimension of space. You can think about changing the type of order parameter or changing the dimension of the measuring surface, okay? So those are three ways to scale this up. So let's, let's do each of those things in turn. The easiest one is the dimension of space. Okay, that's what, like what Joach was asking about a moment ago. Okay, so suppose we scale up, well, for, for we'll go from 2D to 3D, okay? But I'm not changing what's the, what's the director, the order parameter, right? The order parameter is still defined in two dimensions, okay? So I'm looking at a two-dimensional order uh, that can vary as a function of x, y, and z. And I'm not yet changing what's the measuring surface. That is this integration path, okay? I had an integration path, what I showed you before, that's one dimensional. Either it's one dimensional from left to right, or it's one dimensional going around a loop, okay? I still want this measuring surface to be a one dimensional path. I'll deal with that later. So, the topological defects are now going to be lines in three dimensions as opposed to points in two dimensions. Okay. So the simplest way to see that is I could just take the two-dimensional system that I showed you before and extend it uniformly into the third dimension. Okay. And then the point, the red dot right here, gets extended into a whole red line going up there, okay? And so this is a, uh, a straight disclination line or defect line, okay? I can tell it's a defect line by drawing my measuring surface, this green loop going around it in some full circle, okay? And if I integrate the changes of angle going around this, I get uh, 2 pi divided by 2 pi, right? So it's a topological charge of 1. And um, I could move the loop. Check this region, or check this region. Or I could make a great big loop, or I could make a diagonal loop, or any funny kind of loop, okay? And any loop that's going around the red line is going to give the same integral. The red line does not have to be straight. It could be curved like this, okay? And still I could integrate around the loop and find out what's the topological charge associated with that line. Okay? We could do something interesting to make a closed loop here, okay? The closed loop could be something that looks like, you know, at this value of Z, there's no defect. And then when you go up, it looks like it's splitting into a plus and a minus, okay? And stays like that, splitting into a plus and a minus, and then it comes together, it closes uh, way up at the top. Okay? For um, any of you who like relativity, this is kind of analogous to the world line. In, in relativity, right? That if you think of this vertical coordinate as being sort of analogous to time, then it's as if you have a particle and an antiparticle that form here and then they get apart and then they come back together and annihilate each other. Um, lines like this cannot terminate inside the material, only at boundaries. How do I know that? Well, because if you had a line like this, and it just terminated somewhere, then I would say, well, my green loop gives an integral of one, and then there's an integral of zero. But how did it get from one to zero? Right? There's, no, there's no way of, of doing that. Okay. Um, okay, so that's scaling up the topological defects. Uh, okay, 
it works the same way for scaling up the topological solitons. And this was your question a minute ago, okay? That um, what was a point in one dimension can scale up to be a, a line in two dimensions straight line, or it could be a curved line like that, or it could be a closed loop, your whole loop like this, okay? Um, and a line like this can terminate inside the material. It terminates with a topological defect because a topological defect is a place that takes you from uh, winding number equals zero to a winding number equals one. I would change like that. Um, and so these things can be uh, uh, lines in 2D or walls in 3D. I didn't make a picture of that, but you can imagine extending it into the third dimension also. Uh, so when you extend it, so can you have more than one defect of the same type? And then how will you connect when you extend to the other dimension? Uh, you could have more than one. So for example, you know, you have a wall here and you could have make another wall there, right? And you can have as many walls as you want, right? You could have a whole bunch of parallel walls that don't touch each other, okay? Um, one important point to notice about that, okay, is that when you're dealing with these topological solitons, the total charges don't have to add up to zero, right? That there can be you know, a positive winding number, and then you can put in another wall with a positive winding number, and another one with a positive winding number. You can put in as many positives as you want, no problem, because they only have short range effects on the director, right? In contrast with the case of topological defects, where you cannot just keep putting in more positives, you better balance them with negatives because otherwise the total distortion will keep adding up and it'll be something enormous. Okay. Um, can um, these walls, you know, can have multiple walls that intersect in some way? Uh, yes, I'm sure you can. I haven't really thought through how that works, but yes, I'm, I'm sure that is possible. Okay, so in, in general, the relationship for topological defects is going to be that the dimension of the defect, that is, is it a point or a line, uh, that's the dimension of space uh, minus the dimension of the measuring surface, which is one, uh, and then minus another one, because the measuring surface is enclosing something. Right? Uh, for a topological soliton, the dimension of the defect is the dimension of space minus the dimension of the measuring surface. Okay, so these things are coming out with different dimensionality. That was my first generalization. Okay, the next generalization is to think about different types of order parameters. Okay, I have been telling you so far about a 2D polar order parameter, okay? But we could think about a 2D pneumatic or a 3D polar or a 3D pneumatic. And maybe I'll briefly mention crystal as well. Um, and these things are all different. So for, for a 2D pneumatic, okay? Um, that's similar to a 2D polar order parameter. But now n and negative n represent the same physical state. Um, and that is um, because of what pneumatic order means, as I talked about in my first uh, uh, talk at uh, Tel Aviv University a month ago. Okay. So n and, and, double, and negative n represent the same physical state. So we could draw it uh, pictorially as a double headed arrow, right? So that, yeah. Okay. Um, the story now is pretty similar to the polar story, um, except that the winding number can now be an integer or a half integer. That is, you don't have to go around 
uh, through a full circle of two pi to get back to where you started, you could just go halfway around the circle and that gets back to the same physical state as where you started. Okay? So this then is a topological defect with uh, a charge of plus a half, right? That as you go around the loop in a full circle, the orientation rotates through half a circle. Likewise, this is a topological defect of negative a half. As you go around a full circle, the director rotates through half a circle in the opposite sense. Can you use one of the pens to like show the path? Is that the pens? Uh, right. As go okay. As I go around like this, the orientation rotates in a clockwise direction. As I go in like a clock, clockwise direction. And this one, the orientation goes around in a counterclockwise direction through half a circle uh, as I go through a counterclockwise. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and uh, likewise with the topological solitons, uh, the winding number uh, can be an integer or a half integer. Okay. So here, as you go from this side to this side, uh, you have a rotation of half, right? Of, of halfway around the circle, right? So this would be called a pi wall because the director is changing by pi radius from the left uniform area to the right uniform area. So that's a little bit of a change, not a really big change. Okay. When you go into three dimensions, okay, a three dimensional order parameter, this actually now is a very big change. Okay, let me show you why. Okay, so suppose you try to construct a topological defect with some integer charge. Okay, so this is 3D polar, polar now. So the arrows are single hit arrows. Okay, so. Here is 3D polar order uh, as a function of X and Y, okay? I think maybe I've made a plus one defect right there, right? It looks like a plus one defect, right? Okay. Um, now, um, let's make a whole bunch of continuous changes to the director. That is, I'm going to gradually tip up the director to point more towards the Z direction, okay? I'm gradually tipping it upwards, upwards, upwards. And now look, ah, it's pointing in the Z direction everywhere. There's no more defect, right? I continuously got rid of that defect by making a whole bunch of tiny little changes. So in some topological sense, that means there never was a defect there to begin with. Okay. Um, one uh, way to analyze that is to say the set of all possible orientations for the vector are represented by the unit sphere, right? The vector, the yellow arrows here, can point anywhere on the unit sphere, okay? So here's the unit sphere, right? That's the set of orientations. Okay. If I look all along my green measuring surface, my green integration contour, okay, let's say, you know, this point maps to this point on the unit sphere, right? This point maps to this point on the unit sphere, right? And so my path around here in a counterclockwise sense is mapping to a path around the unit sphere, going to the back, coming around here and around the front, right? And then I'm gonna make a whole bunch of continuous changes and see what happens to the path on the unit sphere, okay? So my changes are taking the path on the unit sphere and it's moving to higher and higher latitudes. And then eventually the path that I thought was enclosing the sphere, it shrinks down to just the North Pole. Um, 
topologists have a funny way of saying that. They say you can't lasso a sphere, right? So you guys know what that means. A lasso is something that cowboys use, right? It is a rope with a loop of rope at the end. And cowboys know how to throw it so that the loop goes around the cow's neck and then they can pull it and it pulls the cow somewhere, right? Okay, so suppose, you know, you try to make a defect which uh, lassos the sphere, okay? So that my loop going around here is gonna be something that can't shrink on the sphere. But no, you can't lasso a sphere because as you try to pull the lasso tighter, it's just going to shrink down to the point, fall right off the circuit. Okay, so that corresponds to the plus one defect uh, escaping into the third dimension, like this. Okay? It works with the minus one also. Uh, so here's the minus one, and um, again, I can just tip up the director everywhere, and so in the picture in real space. You can see everything changing to be just pointing in the Z direction, okay? And on the unit sphere, it started with a loop going around backwards. You can't tell that because it didn't mark the direction, but the loop going around backwards shrinks down to a point at the top. So this is to say that the 3D polar model doesn't have this kind of topological defects, okay? It's quite different from the 2D polar model. The 2D polar model had defects with charge that could be any positive or negative integer. The 3D polar model doesn't have any such defects, period, right? None of these defects with a winding number associated with a 1D measuring surface. It still might have topological solitons, these two pi walls, depending on energetic considerations. If you apply a field, you get a wall, but not, not singularities like this. What, whoops, what about uh, a 3D pneumatic? This is kind of different, okay? For a 3D pneumatic, Suppose you want to construct a topological defect with a half integer charge, okay? So when all the directors are lying down, it looks kind of like this, right? This is what I showed you before as a minus half defect, okay? That, well, let's see what that maps onto for the order parameter space, okay? The order parameter space now is not a sphere, it's a hemisphere because n and negative n are equivalent to each other, okay? And so any point in the northern hemisphere is the same thing as a point in the southern hemisphere, and I'm only gonna draw the northern hemisphere. Okay? It's a hemisphere with the special understanding that you, know, you can tunnel through the center of the earth. And it's, it's trivially easy to tunnel through the center of the earth. Okay? So that this point uh, at the east pole is the same as this point at the west pole. Um, okay, so a half integer defect like this, that looks like a path where we go uh, around. We, we start at a point like this, and then we go around to orientations like this, okay, that are pointing forwards, forwards, and then it comes there and then it just turns back, right? This is a half loop. Now, that is stuck. This cannot escape into the third dimension, okay? You can lasso a hemisphere like this, okay? So I can try uh, my continuous transformation into 3D, whoops. And in this continuous transformation, as the directors tip upwards, you can see the, um, the minus half turns into something that looks kind of twisted like this. 
and then it keeps going and it turns into something that looks like a plus set, right? So in the topological sense, you do have half integer defects in a 3D nomadic. Okay, a 3D nomadic is quite different from a 3D polar phase in that sense. Okay, um, but it's still also different from a 2D nomadic because in a 2D nomadic, uh, plus half defects are totally different from minus half defects. In the 3D nomadic, you can change plus half defect to a minus half defect. Okay. So in a, a 3D nomadic, you could say the possibilities are, you know, either you get a defect that's half charged, and you don't say whether it's plus half or minus half, or there's no defect, right? Any integer can be transformed into nothing. Any half integer can be transformed into any other half integer. Okay. Now, what else do I have? There are related things with crystal and quarter. I, I'm just going to mention these briefly. I don't want to take a lot of time with this. With crystalline order, um, people talk about dislocations, okay? That is, that if you go around in a loop like this, a loop that you think will close, it fails to close. Okay. And it fails to close by a certain vector, which is called the Burgers vector. So that is something like a topological charge. It's a vector charge as opposed to an angle charge. Okay. And in this case, the vector by which the loop fails to close, right? If you go up three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Oops, I'm not where I started. Right, it fails to close by one lattice vector this way. And um, this is a vector which is perpendicular to the uh, core of the defect right there. That's called an edge dislocation. In this example, it's like a parking garage where you go around a loop that you think is going to close but it fails to close because you're up one level from where you started, okay? And here, that vector is a vector in the Z direction, parallel to the core, and that's called a screw dislocation, okay? So it's kind of related to the 2D polar and the 2D pneumatic, but with this vector charge instead of an angle charge, okay? So these objects are called dislocations, edge dislocations or screw dislocations. In crystals, you can also have disclinations as a more severe kind of defect where you uh, insert or remove a whole angle. And so if you go around a loop that you think will close over here, um, it's, it's you, you wind up not just in a different position from where you thought you were going to be, but you're even pointing in a different direction from where you thought you were going to be. So this is like driving in Boston, where you can make four left turns and God knows what direction you're pointing in, right? Um, okay, Jonathan, it's also the, the structure of a knitted key And it's all that, that too. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and so, uh, yeah, here are two examples of that. Okay. I want to skip over that to go into my third generalization, okay, which has to do with different kinds of measuring surfaces. So far, everything that I've been talking about here has to do with one dimensional measuring surfaces. That is a path. Okay, so you either go on a path that's a loop, or you go on a path that's a straight line, but it's a one dimensional path. Okay, and measuring things on a one dimensional path, that is what topologists would call a, a pi one kind of uh, uh, defect. Okay? But that's not the only possibility. 
another common possibility is a two-dimensional measuring surface, which topologists would call pi two. And then a rare possibility is a three-dimensional measuring surface, pi three. Um, let me talk about the 2D one a lot and the 3D one a little bit. For the 2D measuring surface, okay. Suppose we have three-dimensional polar order, like a magnet, for example, uh, and it's defined in three-dimensional space, okay? So that's characterized by a unit vector n, a three-dimensional unit vector, as a function of x, y, and z. So here's a kind of generic non-defect example of a director defined as a function of x, y, and z. Okay. Now, let's insert a two-dimensional measuring surface, like this green sphere. Okay. And so everywhere on the green sphere, there's a unit vector defined. Okay. So I can take the director everywhere on this green sphere and map it to a point in director space, which is this unit sphere over here. So for example, this point maps onto the North Pole. This point maps onto a point over here. This maps onto a point over there, okay? So now I look at the unit vector defined everywhere here, and I ask, how many times does that cover the unit sphere here? Okay, and the coverage can be either in a positive or a negative sense, the same way as with winding number. With winding number, remember, we could have the, the orientation go around counterclockwise, and that counts as positives, or counterclockwise, right? Or it could go clockwise, and that counts as negatives, okay? It's the same thing here in a mathematical way that I don't really want to go into, that you can cover area on the unit sphere in either a positive sense or a negative sense, okay? And then I'm going to add up all the area that's covered over here, okay? Um, in this trivial example, it adds up to zero. So this is the mathematical way of defining that, okay? So the object, so it's a two-dimensional integral, you're integrating over a sphere, green sphere. And the thing that you're integrating um, is what mathematicians would call the Jacobian of the transformation from, um, from real space to order brand space okay and so it tells how this area is transforming into an area over here okay and what it transforms into is zero okay but it doesn't have to transform into zero it could transform into something that integrates to a total solid angle of any multiple of four pi, four pi being the integrated solid game. Right. Here is, uh, here are a couple of non-trivial examples. Okay. So this top example is an example where the orientation is pointing outwards from a point everywhere. Okay, so there's a weird point in the middle that you can't really see, okay? And going out from that point, the orientation is pointing out, 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 right? In, in all, all of 3D space, okay? This thing is called a hedgehog or a radial hedgehog because it resembles this kind of a guy, right? Where um, it's an animal that's approximately a sphere. It has its fur pointing outwards everywhere. Okay. Now, the orientation on the sphere here, so the sphere there, okay, the, you know, the South Pole maps to the bottom, North Pole maps to the top, right? 
you cover every point on this sphere exactly once in a positive sense. So if I take my integral for the topological charge, it adds up to four pi. And then divided by four pi means plus one. Okay. So this is then considered a positive defect in this sense for a two-dimensional measured surface. Likewise, this one is a negative defect. It's a defect where the orientation uh, comes in from the top and the bottom, and then it goes out everywhere in the xy plane. Okay? That is called a hyperbolic hedgehog. Okay? It's a variation on this. Okay? And it uh, also covers this sphere. Uh, you know, the top point maps to the south pole. The bottom point maps to the North Pole, so forth, right? And it covers this sphere in a negative mathematical sense. So this adds up to a negative total topological charge. So those are topological defects as defined by the 2D measuring surface as opposed to the one-dimensional measuring surface. Now, uh, uh, yeah. please, please. So, uh, in the example that you showed in the last one, sphere, I'm sorry, the defect that you showed in the example of, uh, you had this thing, you cannot last one sphere, so you had a defect in one plane, but then. Right, you would do but, but I'm not using a lasso. I'm using no, no, exactly. a, a two dimensional right. lasso. So if you would use the spherical integrator of a sphere in that problem, you would get a defect. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And. Well, for that problem. No, even you, this, is over. this is a different object, right? This is, um, no, so, different. so the, the thing I was showing a while ago here, right? This is pointing um, out everywhere in the XY plane, okay? If I extend this into the Z direction, it's pointing out in the XY plane. It's not pointing in the Z direction, okay? So if I try to put my, my sphere around this thing, um, there is a point where the director is undefined, right? The place where the central point hits the sphere. And so it's not a legitimate construction. I need to have the unit vector defined everywhere on the measuring surface. Um, it's okay if it's undefined inside or outside the measuring surface, but it has to be defined everywhere on the measuring surface. So I cannot apply the 2D measuring sphere to this thing, but I can apply it to the hedgehog here. Okay, because now I have a well-defined orientation everywhere on the green space. Now you remember, Back when I was doing the simple stuff, like the one-dimensional surface, right? Um, I could have a one-dimensional path that goes around something, or I could have a soliton where the one-dimensional path goes right through something. Okay. Here, this is a two-dimensional surface that goes around something, okay? But what about a two-dimensional surface that goes right through something? That would be a situation where, say, my measuring surface is just a flat plane, okay? And I have a director that's defined as a function of x and y, right? So it's a 3dn as a function of x and y. In that case, the measuring surface is the whole plane. Right, I can probe everywhere in the plane. Okay, and then the vector field everywhere in the plane maps onto a point in order parameter space. And I can ask, does it cover the whole sphere? Okay, um, in this particular example, um, the answer is, is it integrates to zero, right? So my same integral to 
assess this scaled up version of winding number, um, it, it integrates to zero. There's some positive places and there's some negative places. Um, but there can be other situations where it integrates to something that's not zero. In those cases, this thing is now called a skirmia number. Okay, that's what Jair was asking you about a few minutes ago. Okay, and if the order at infinity is uniform, then you can say the skirmion number has to be an integer, right? It might be zero, it might be not zero. Here are a couple of examples with skirmions, okay? So this is a three-dimensional unit vector as a function of x and y. Right in the middle, it's pointing up. As you go out, it tips over. When you go out to infinity, it points down everywhere. In infinity. Right? This covers all possible orientations exactly once. Okay? Skirmion number is one. Here is a related thing, but it's twisted instead of splayed outwards. It also covers all possible orientations exactly once. These things are skirmions or, or baby skirmions because there are other kinds that are even more complicated, okay? But these are the simple versions of skirmions and these things form in magnets, okay? And this version is stabilized by chirality and this version is stabilized by surface polarity. Um, and, you know, like with the first version of solitons, they could be spread out or they could be concentrated in some narrow region. And there are energetic considerations that determine how concentrated they are. Okay? But these are topological solitons and not topological defects because you're defining it by a 2D measuring surface that is the whole plane. It's not surrounding something. And um, you, um, you uh, are, are integrating right through you. There's no secret. Right. This is the anti skirmion where uh, it's pointing up there and then it has this more complicated structure as you go outwards and then it all points down. Okay, what about for a 3D pneumatic order with a 2D measuring surface? You can still have hedgehogs, okay? So here's a radial hedgehog, a hyperbolic hedgehog, okay? These things are defined for a 3D pneumatic order the same way they are defined for 3D polar order except for the fact that the sign is ambiguous because you have three powers of n here. Remember that n and negative n define the same physical state. So there is a weird ambiguity of the sign. They don't want to talk about it. Um, and likewise, with skirmions, um, you can have a baby skirmion like this, um, where the director it's vertical and then it tips over and then it turns around and it's vertical again. And this has a skirmion number of one, or maybe it's minus one. The sign is ambiguous. Now, um, the 3D pneumatic model is special because it can have different kinds of topological defects, right? It can have disconnations which are defined by this one dimensional measuring surface. And it can also have hedgehogs, which are defined by the two dimensional measuring surface. An important point is that these are two different kinds of defects. You can't just add them up, right? Sometimes when people hear that there's a topological charge for disconnections and a topological charge for hedgehogs, 
they want to add them or something. And, and no, there are different kinds of topological charge. They're separate things to think about. But one interesting relationship that you can ask about is to say, suppose you have a disclination loop like this, and you put a great big two-dimensional measuring surface around it. So Yoav was earlier asking about, you know, what if you get a straight disclination? And I said, no, you can't define that because you can't put a surface around it, okay? But if the disclination is not straight, if it's closed in a loop, then you can enclose it by a great big sphere, okay? And then you can ask, uh, does the whole thing have a hedgehog charge, right? By doing the integral over this green surface. And the answer is sometimes. Um, there are different kinds of disclination loops, and some of them have a hedgehog charge, and some of them don't. And this is important for people working in active pneumatic liquid crystals, because in that field, you have disclination loops that are constantly forming out of nothing or condensing, annihilating themselves down to nothing. And those all have to be the kind of disclination loops with zero hedgehog charge, because if they had non-zero hedgehog charge, they couldn't form out of nothing. So that's an important classification in that field. The last thing that I prepared to talk about is about the 3D measuring surface, okay? Let me just mention that briefly, because uh, I've been talking for a while. For a 3D measuring surface, okay, that's scaling up this concept one more level, okay. We could ask first, you know, can you have topological defects that are enclosed by a 3D measuring surface? That's not really going to work because we live in three dimensions. You can't have a three dimensional space that's enclosing something to go enclose, right? You'd have to be in a four-dimensional universe for that, okay? So forget about that, okay? So you're not gonna have topological defects like this. But you can still have topological solitons where the 3D measuring surface equals the 3D space that we're living in. That is, you're integrating something complicated over all of 3D space. That, Actually exists, okay? And these topological solitons are called Hopfions, and the topological charge, the thing that you integrate to know that some configuration has this property, is called the Hopf index. This actually exists in the lab, in particular in Ivan Smoyer's lab. And so this is one of the more complicated things, which I believe he presented when he was giving his talks uh, earlier this, this year. That is the end of what I prepared to talk about for my research of this uh, topological defect story. Um, I can um, stop here and we can eat our pizza, our virtual pizza. No, 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 is pizza. pizza. I think it's just outside. Oh, amazing. Um, or, I mean, I can, I can answer questions or I can talk about any of these other subjects, but maybe you're all kind of burnt out. I, I suggest maybe we take questions. If there's anyone. I can also give you a joke. I made a, I made a, a Pokemon that's a baby for me on if you want to show that. And Robin made a Pokemon that's a baby sperm. So, <laughs> it's so no. cute. No, no, I made it a while ago. <laughs> I thought that would help you remember that. <laughs> right, right. And hyperbolic pet toss has got to be best name for any man. Or a superhero. Or a superhero. Yeah. Hyperbolic yeah, yeah. Pet okay, but if there are any questions, uh, we could. Yeah. Yes, sir. We have a couple of different 
Polar versus nomadic are, are two kinds of order for what sort of phase that you're studying. And that's not at the defect. That's your, let's look away from the defects. Okay. Away from the defects, polar means that you have some order that's pointing in one direction. Okay. It's like a vector. Nomadic means you have an axis back and forth on the same axis. Okay. So in the place away from the defects, you have uh, different kinds of bits. Okay. And so magnets typically form polar. Uh, liquid crystals typically form nomadic phases, where the molecules are oriented back and forth along some axis. Although there are exceptional liquid crystal phases that have polar order also. Um, so that has to do with the kind of material that you're studying. For uh, how to detect them experimentally. Um, well, I mean, there, there are a range of different kinds of techniques. The simplest one to think about would be you know, if you have a, a two-dimensional film, okay? So suppose you have a, a, a liquid crystal with a, a plus half effect there, okay? So that means that the director is oriented something like, like this, okay? Um, a typical liquid crystal experiment would be to say you have a, a thin film, a cell, right? And you put this between cross polarizers, okay? So that you have a polarizer in the front, which is oriented this way. And you have a polarizer in the back, which is oriented this way, okay? And now you shine light through it, okay? And you see what you can detect coming out the back, okay? It depends on the orientation of the director, okay? So the light goes through the first filter, it hits a director like this, it keeps its orientation, and then it hits the, the next filter and nothing gets through, so it looks fine. On the other hand, if you're at a place where the director is at some angle like this, okay, then light comes in, it gets polarized this way. It hits this environment that has an optical axis at an angle, and that changes the polarization state of the light, okay, in a way that I don't really want to get into right here, but it, it rotates the polarization state of the light. When the light is passing through a birefringent medium with an orientation in this diagonal direction, so that the light doesn't get blocked when it gets through the second polarizer. Okay. And there's a general argument that the light intensity is something proportional to the sine squared of two theta, where theta is the orientation away from the polarizer and analyzer directions, okay? And so uh, a pattern like this uh, would have some uh, bright regions and some dark regions. And you could count where are the bright regions and where are the dark regions. Uh, let's see, I guess it would be dark here it would be bright here, dark and bright, because this is where there'd be a diagonal orientation versus a horizontal or vertical direction, okay? And so this would look like a pattern of brushes in an optical experiment, that you'd see these regions that are bright versus dark. And you would count how many bright regions there are. And they, you would say, oh, there are two. And two is associated with half charge. If it would be a charge of plus or minus one, you would see four bright brush regions and four bright dark regions, OK? And then you could tell what is positive or negative uh, by rotating the polarizers and seeing how the whole pattern rotates. 
So this is like the, the simplest experimental technique. There are lots of other versions that go, go beyond that. Okay. Oh, Yeah, you turn it to tell if it's positive. Like, so if you have a plus one defect, you see four brushes, and mm -hmm. when you rotate, it rotates one. You rotate the polarizer, it rotates one there. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the problem with the chart. Mm -hmm. All yes. of this defect can be destroyed. And if there's any other problem, that can be destroyed. How it can be destroyed? Either it can go to the edge of the sample, right? And if it hits the edge, it's, yeah, it's right. Or it can meet an anti-defect. And the two will annihilate, like a particle and an anti-defect. Yeah. Th those are the two possibilities. But you know, in the interior, the total topological charges of the defects are going to be constant. Often that will be determined by the boundary conditions that some experimenter applies to the region. The case with that solitons is different, that the total topological charge does not have to be fixed because the effects of solitons on the director far away are just short range. Okay, I suggest we stop here. Mm -hmm. And thank you very much, John. Thank you. Lots of thanks, Sharon, because you're right now with the rest of the